Hi everybody, my name is Johnny and I'm an alcoholic. I'm glad to be here this morning. I'm, uh, I'm glad to be sober. I, I love this building. I don't know why. Uh, maybe it makes me remind myself how old I am. That's why. But I, I, I want to thank whoever's responsible for extending the privilege of me participating at an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting. It's, uh, my opinion, and I hope it always remains such, that it's some type of a privilege to come and sit in these rooms. I, I've never been able to get it through my sick head that I have a right for everything that goes on in Alcoholics Anonymous. What the hell do you expect from an old convict, for Christ's sake? <laughs> The reason I tell you that is because everything that's good and decent in my life today is the byproduct of the God I discovered sitting in meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous. Now I'm extremely pleased to be here this morning, uh, fully clothed and in my right mind. <laughs> and the reason I tell you that is because it seems like the longer I stay sober, the more necessary it becomes for me to remember from whence I came. And, I don't ever want to forget that a little over 55 years ago, probably right now, uh, I came to in a cell in solitary confinement in a maximum security penitentiary drifting in and out of total insanity. And because of a loving God has expressed himself through our program called Alcoholics Anonymous, it's no longer necessary for me to crawl around on my hands and knees like an animal. If I don't get nothing else out of this deal, I guess I can live with that all the way to the car in the parking lot makes me feel good. But I'd really like to stand here and tell you without a shadow of a doubt and go along with the popular theory sometimes today that that's where alcohol took me to. No, that's where I took me to. The only thing that alcohol ever did in my life, it kept me alive long enough to get to Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm as sure as I'm standing here, if I hadn't taken a drink of alcohol, I'd have probably blown my brains out before I was nine years old. I don't know, it seemed like to me that I was born needing some type of an answer, but the problem with that is I didn't know what was wrong with me. I'm a little restless and irritable and discontented as a child, and I, I don't understand then, as I know now, that those are the symptoms of the most deadly illness that's ever been known to mankind. I didn't know that. I knew a lot about whiskey and drinking because everybody in my family did it. I mean, they were bootleggers whores, gamblers. They went to jails and penitentiaries and worked in whorehouses. They were just a real functional kind of family, I guess, back there in Kansas where I come from. And, and I didn't seem to think anything about that. I did, really didn't. I just, you know, it's just the way it was. I just knew that I didn't want it. And so I started looking for a way out of this dilemma that I was in. And my circumstances weren't my dilemma. My dilemma was what was going on inside of me. And so I started looking away from it. I looked up one day, I saw my grandmother. Now my grandmother lived when she was 90 years old and she never took a drink of alcohol or smoked a cigarette in her life. My grandmother wouldn't think it's a big deal. I've been sober almost 54 years. Big deal, she'd say. I ain't had a drink for 90. <laughs> and then she'd cackle. That's what they do. You know, I used to tell her she ought to have a couple of drinks, make her feel better from time to time. My grandmother got everything she needed out of this church she went to. I remember as a little child, I spent a great deal of time with my grandmother because everybody else was busy. And uh, grandma used to get up on Sunday morning where they tore her house up the night before this crazy people. And she'd step over and put the best thing she had on and she disappeared for a couple of hours. And when she got back, something had happened to her. I could see it as clear as I can see you. She was a little lighter in her step a little easier in her being, and she kind of danced around them and cleaned them up and sang songs to Jesus. Now I took a look at that, and I make one error after another in my life, but I got to thinking that all I'm going to have to do is go where my grandmother goes, do what my grandmother does, and I'd be like my grandmother, because I wanted to be the way my grandmother looked. 
And so as a little child, my grandmother took me and set me in the church with her, and I sat there and waited for what was happening to Granny to happen to me. And I don't remember nothing happening. She said, I said to her, when, Granny, when am I going to get it? She said, when you go down front. Well, I went down front. Nothing happened down there either. <laughs> then I said to her, well, when and when, Grandma? I need this. When is it going to happen? She says, when you get sprinkled. Well, I went down front and got sprinkled. And all I remember about that is it was cold and damp. Had nothing to do with anything. And see, what I've learned here in Alcoholics Anonymous and my travels here in alcohol, there wasn't anything wrong with my grandmother's church. There was just something wrong with the jackass sitting in it, me. See, I'm looking for something way out here to make me feel better in here. And it only goes to prove to me that the problem has always been there. So one day I sat on the back porch of my grandfather's house watching my grandfather drink whiskey out of a fruit jar. And he put it down and he went somewhere and I picked it up and took a drink of it. That's all I did. And I guess according to the book Alcoholics Anonymous, which is the only authority here, the next couple of minutes of my life was what makes me an alcoholic. I didn't know that. Because that stuff was magic to me. It went down inside of me and stilled the madness. It took me from the black pit of nothingness and it stood me into the gray fringes of the business of living and installed on me some type of arrogance that said, damn you world, it's all right. I'm not good enough to be around the good people, but I'm too good to be around the bad people. It's okay right here. That's what alcohol did for me. But I wasn't ready for what happened to me next because it doesn't happen to everybody who drinks. It only happens to maybe one out of 10 people who ingest alcohol. What happens to me once I put alcohol into my system, I didn't know this, I'm drinking to overcome a craving that's beyond all human help and beyond all human power. I didn't know that. I didn't know that the day I walked into Alcoholics Anonymous. Because what happened to me is that three days later, I was pulled out from underneath a bridge and stood in front of a judge and sentenced to the Hutchinson State Reform School. Twenty years later, I took a drink of alcohol. They pulled me out of a car in Compton and stood me in front of a judge and sentenced me to 20 years in the penitentiary. Now that's what happened to me when I drank. I got drunk and went places. <laughs> I used to travel around. It. I went from reform school to reform school to junior penitentiaries to penitentiaries to nut houses. Now they call them treatment centers. <laughs> I'm a little more partial to nut house if you want to know the truth. It's a little more macho. Come on, for Christ's sake. If you're going to be bad, you ought to be bad. Don't quit drinking because you puke a little. Hang in there. <laughs> Give it everything you got. Alcoholics Anonymous works a lot better when you throw in everything there. I threw it all in there. I gave it everything I had. I gave it my sanity. I gave it my health. I gave whatever talent God gave me. I gave my family up. I gave it all. I destroyed my mother. I did it all. I did it all. And at the ripe old age of 25 years old, when I came to in that cell in solitary confinement, there wasn't a single solitary soul left upon the face of this earth that would send me a penny postcard. They were all gone. But you know what? They should be gone. I don't have any right to have any of them back. Not whatsoever. Everything that's good and decent in my life is the byproduct of the God I discovered sitting in meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous. But that's what stumbled into your meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous that day. November the 4th, 1959, I stumbled into my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I didn't come here to get sober. I was as physically sober that day when I came to my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous as I am right now. But that had always seemed to be my problem. If I could have stayed loaded forever, I'd have never got to Alcoholics Anonymous. But I kept getting interrupted after on my happy road of destiny and people in them little black and white cars. And there I was, and I stumbled into this meeting. And the only reason I came to my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous is because they let some women come in there on a panel that Sunday morning. I came to my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, it'll soon be 54 years ago, to smell perfume. 
I've been honking and sniffing around her ever since. <laughs> you know, I, that may have what got me to Alcoholics Anonymous, but uh, that's not brought me into the meeting, but that's not what got me to Alcoholics Anonymous. I know exactly as I stand here today what brought me to Alcoholics Anonymous and what's kept me here from that very first day to this one without any type of alcohol or mood altering chemicals in my system. To my grandmother, my loving grandmother, prayed for me every day of her life. The last time I saw my grandmother alive, I was laying strapped down on a bed, 128 pounds of bright yellow tied down on a bed in Manager's Clinic in Topeka, Kansas, which is the way I always ended up. And my grandmother was doing for me what she did all of her life. She prayed for me. Somehow or other, my grandmother must have knew something about me that I had no capabilities of finding out. And I'm not going to stand here and be stupid enough to try to make people believe that my grandmother's prayers didn't keep me out of harm's way from time to time. I tell you what I believe without a shadow of a doubt. I believe every single person in this room has come to Alcoholics Anonymous because somebody prayed for them once upon a time. Problem is, <clears throat> I didn't know that, but I'm sure my grandmother's prayers kept me out of harm's way from time to time. But I'll tell you something I know for a natural fact. You see, my last time out, I killed me mostly. I had two years doing to me anything I wanted to do to me with as much money as I needed to do it with. And I ended up in the Los Angeles County Jail, tied down on a bed with a doctor standing at the foot of my bed telling me I was going to die. That didn't seem like a good idea or a bad idea to me. Because I was at a point in my life when I didn't seem that I wanted to go on maintaining whatever kind of a sick image I had created on my selfish, self-centered walk through life. I no longer wanted to be a big time dope dealer. I never wanted to be another gangbanger anymore. I didn't want to be on all these things that I had become in juvenile hall. I never wanted to be any of those kind of things. I never wanted to destroy my mother's soul. I never wanted to be responsible for the death of my 17-year-old brother. I never wanted to be the, the responsible for the harm that I inflicted on people. All through my life, I stepped and walked and hurt and used people. No wonder there was nobody around when I was crawling around on my hands and knees. I didn't deserve any of them, don't deserve any of them today. That's what, death seemed like a great idea to me. I've learned to understand what saying that the total end of alcoholism when there's no answer, when there's no getting loaded and there's no getting sober no more, that's where the suicide of the alcoholic comes in handy. I didn't know that. I wasn't going to commit suicide. I was too in indoctrinated into homicide. I didn't want to commit suicide. <clears throat> One night after a period of time laying in that bed, in the middle of the night, I screamed out the only prayer I'd ever said in my life. I said, oh, God, help me. Now, there were no blinding flashes of light. Nobody come running down the hall with a dozen donuts saying we got an AA meeting down there. I just got up and went to sleep. And two weeks later, I'm up running around the jail looking for some more of the poison that put me back on the bed I'd just gotten off of. And there's a good reason for that. In the back of my sick little head today, just like it was then. When I can't stand life on life's terms any longer, I know what makes the big hurt go away. I know what it does. It always has, and it always will. The consequences be damned. I want relief from it right now. So I got loaded again. A few days later, I stood in front of a judge. He called me a blood-sucking parasite in society. He told me I didn't have a right being around decent people. He put into words what I always knew about me. He put into words things that were driving me crazy when I was sober, the reality of what I had and become and what I was and never wanted to be. But that's what stumbled into your rooms that day. And I moved in and sat down where people like me sit in the back row. I don't want to be up too close. Somebody might think I'm a member of AA or whatever this thing is. I see two big A's up there. I think it's some type of an anti-aircraft brigade. I don't know what Alcoholics Anonymous is. And I sit around and 
and I don't know, people started talking about being sober. And I, my first reaction to that was that Alcoholics Anonymous has nothing to offer me. And the reason I thought that is because I was as physically sober as I am right now. And I'm about two steps out of a straitjacket, if you really want to know the truth. So I think it don't work. But I was fascinated by the people. I couldn't figure out what they were doing. You know what these people did, these crazy people, that I couldn't figure out? They got in their cars on Sunday morning. They bought their own gasoline, paid their own expenses. They drove 100 miles up those old back roads to spend two hours talking to a room full of people who didn't want to listen to them. People like me who sat in the back row and made fun of them. Let me tell you how sick that is. Here I am sitting in the penitentiary. I don't know when I'm going home and I'm making fun of people who are leaving in an hour. <laughs> oh, but I'm hip. If I'd have had a hat, I'd have probably had it on backwards. This was for the days when only the women wore earrings and the men had tattoos. <clears throat> I don't know what this thing is. I have no idea what it is. Nobody ever said, you got to go to ANA. What the psychiatrist said is I was sitting here in my straitjacket after another series. If you didn't drink these things and swallow these things and smoke these things and shoot these things, you wouldn't have any problems. And what none of those great learned men ever took into consideration was this. Every single time they told me that, I was as physically sober as I am this moment. How I would like to have been able to say to him, you don't understand, doctor. Take it back to 1950, before my little brother died. Take it back to 1941, 42, before I had to join that gang. Take all them things that I had done in this walk through life that I had done. Take all those things away from I won't have to do this. But all I could do is sit there and know that he didn't know what was wrong with me either. Nobody ever seemed to know. I've been hearing that from therapists and psychiatrists and sociologists and penologists since I was 10 years old. You're going to die in an institution. You're going to die in a gang fight. You're going to die from an overdose. The police are going to kill you. On and on. Start me off at 10 years old when I'm 25, I believe every single word of it. I got no light at the end of that tunnel, none whatsoever. And so when I got to you, that was the state that I was in. Ain't no way out of this dilemma that I'm in. No way whatsoever of me getting out of this. Nobody knew, and you didn't look like any type of an answer at all. You were all old. People got up there and one old lady said she drank for a long time. Hell, you could look at her and know she'd been somewhere for a long time. She said, I used to drink. I said, I'll bet you did. Bad stuff, too. See, I knew everything when I got to Alcoholics Night. I'm a walking encyclopedia of useless information. And here I am, sitting in a room a long, long time ago, and I'm staring at an answer that I had sold my soul for. But I don't recognize the answer because I don't know what my problem is. I haven't got a clue what's wrong with me. So I came back to your meetings because I'd seen you. And seeing you, there was an attraction there. And so I kept coming back. But the more I came back, the more surely was that I was not alcoholic. Because I would hear people get up and pull it like this and say things like this. I used to drink. Now I don't drink anymore, and everything is just wonderful. Now back there in the inventory point where I'm sitting, I'm saying to myself, I'm not alcoholic then. I'm as physically sober as that clown saying that, and I want to kill him. I'm nuts. See, what I'm trying to equate, I don't know this, because I hadn't investigated the only answer that's in this book. What I didn't know was that I'm trying to equate a problem with alcohol with this deadly, debilitating, spiritual illness called alcoholism. And I don't know that. 
So I just think I'm doomed and nothing's going on. What saved my life was very simply this. A man wandered into that institution on a panel on a Sunday morning a long time ago. A man that I knew did 23 flat years in the penitentiary. A man who was my baseball coach when I was a star second baseman for the San Quentin Pirates for a couple of years. I put that on a resume one time. You ought to saw that guy's look. He said, my, San Quentin? And I said, yeah. He says, uh, that must have been a good school. Where, I was up near Stanford. He says, you must have learned a lot of things here. And I said, you bet I did. <laughs> and what that man said, this little man, this little bandit, he knew more about what was wrong with me without even talking to me than every professional that had been treating me and looking at me for 20 years in the state of California and the federal government. He stood very simply and he said a very simple phrase that means more to me today than it did then. He said, you don't have to live like this no more if you don't want to. You don't have to do it like this no more, he said. Nobody had ever said that to me. They just said, don't drink, swallow, smoke, and shoot, but they didn't say how to live without doing it. He just said, don't do it. So after the meeting, I got lowered my little sick image a little bit and wandered up and swallowed my sick pride, whatever it is, and said to him very simply, Les, how do you learn how to live? What I really wanted to do and wanted to know from him, I want to know how I could lay down at night and sleep all night long without the use of some type of high-powered chemical. I just wanted that. Because my life at that time consisted, when I was sober, of waking up in cold sweat at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning with nightmares, staring at my mother across the graveside of my baby brother while I'm handcuffed between two detectives. Recurring nightmare that literally drove me crazy. I didn't want to learn how to get sober and stay sober for the rest of that of my life up to this point and live this good life that's been afforded me in alcohol. Not a, I didn't dream it was even possible. I just want to know how to lay down and sleep without using some type of high-powered chemical. And he looked at me and because he knew me, he said, Johnny, there's a book called Alcoholics Anonymous in the library. If you go get that book, I'll go home and pray that you find some part of you in it. So as my M.O., I got up the next morning, went over to the prison library and stole the book Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm not going to let anybody see in the big time gangster name alongside of anything as lame as Alcoholics Anonymous. I got a reputation to manufacture and take care of. I want you to know that. Now my image is killing me, and the effort that I got to maintain to keep it there is killing me and driving me insane. But I'm not going to let anybody know that I'm so weak that I have to come to Alcoholics Anonymous. So I snuck my book into my cell. And when nobody's around, I started to read it, not with the idea of discovering what's between the covers of that book. Not at all. I just read that book, Alcoholics Anonymous. I started reading the book to prove to you that my case was different, that it wouldn't work for me. See, that's the loser's theme song in Alcoholics Anonymous. You want to hear a loser talk? Listen to him. You don't understand. My case is different. I'm an alcoholic and, uh, yeah. yeah, you're an alcoholic and an idiot, for Christ's sake. <laughs> you can't stay sober here being different, I'm sorry. You might go somewhere else where you're just like them. But But my eyes fell upon a thing in this book that, uh, in the doctor's opinion, is called the phenomenon of craving. It kind of got my attention. I started to think about my life in a period of time, how it ended up like it was. It never started out to be that way. I was given all the talent in the world to be a major league baseball player. In a reform school, I was given a scholarship to play baseball for the major university that just won the College World Series. In San Quentin in 1951, I was given a contract to play baseball for the St. Louis Cardinals. I never got to UCLA to play ball, who I'd love to do, or 
St. Louis to play ball, which I love more than anything. And I thought it was because of where I came from. I thought it was had a family I came from. I thought it was that gang that I joined in Juvenile Hall. I thought it was the things that I had done in my entire life. I was a victim before it became popular, I'll tell you that. <laughs> what I discovered that day was the reason nothing of those things ever happened to me is because I took a drink, period. But you see, then the drink took a drink, and then the drink took me, which is the story of my life. Right then and there, I did something that I did this morning in my room before I went downstairs. I assumed the responsibility for my own actions. I'm not the result of anybody else's actions. I'm the result of my own actions. It's not alcohol's fault. It's not drugs' fault. It's not my family's fault. It's not the state of California or the federal government's fault. It's not the stool pigeon to put me in jail from time to time. It's not anybody, it's not the indoctrination I got into that gang, none of those things. See, I'm the guy that did it. I'm the guy who committed the atrocities. I'm the guy that did the thing. I'm the guy that's responsible for the death of my 17-year-old brother. I'm the guy that drank the whiskey. I'm the guy that shot the dope. I'm the guy that did it. I'm the guy that did it. I'm the culprit. It ain't anybody else's fault. I have to assume the responsibility for that because I can't live without doing it. I know that as well as I'm standing here. I walked out of a man's office a couple of three weeks later. I just spent three hours with him telling him about every rotten, filthy, corruptible thing I'd ever done in my life. I told that man sitting in his office things that would have kept me in the penitentiary, maybe even to the gas chamber for the rest of my natural life. Only one reason I did that. Because my book says that I got to be searching and fearless and thorough. I got to go about this holding nothing back because I'm trying to build an ark to walk a free man. And somewhere in that period of time, in that two years in that penitentiary, as I attended without the help of anybody but what's written in this book, I took the action to bring about the freedom of Alcoholics Anonymous. I took the actions that the book says I must take, and I got free sitting in a penitentiary with no hope of ever getting out of it. But it didn't make any difference. I discovered some type of a God of my very own sitting in that penitentiary. I learned that sitting in that penitentiary is a result of doing what this program says to do without anybody's help with the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. I found out that there were things in the world besides me. That there were flowers and birds and mountains and snow and people. And somewhere along the line I had to go out and try to make the amends the best I could while I was in the penitentiary. And I had to write letters to judges and district attorneys and chiefs of police to make sure there were no secret indictments waiting for me the day I walked out of the penitentiary. I did essentially what the first nine steps of our program says to do. And these things happened to me. And anybody, anybody, there ain't a person in this room whose life won't reach that degree if they try to fulfill the conditions that are written in this book. That's the answer for alcoholism. It's the only answer for alcoholism in 2,000 years of recorded history. It's the only answer. The only answer. I don't know. When I walked out of the penitentiary in June 1961, I don't know nothing about living in a world where I ain't scraping and running and digging, standing on street corners, being tough. I never knew anything about that. But all I wanted to do, I didn't want to go back to my gang. It's the first time I ever walked out of an institution where there wasn't a woman and a dope dealer standing there. All I wanted to do was go to a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. What developed in that period of time was that maybe someday you would let me come and sit with you. That's all I wanted to do. You give me the privilege of coming and sitting with you and I'll do anything you ask me to do. 
52 years has come and gone. To the best of my ability, I fulfilled that requirement of mine in Alcoholics Anonymous. I have done just about everything that Alcoholics Anonymous has asked me to do. And I'll tell you, I would match my life against anybody on this world. Anybody. Now, I know people who have more things than I do, but that don't mean nothing. That's materialistic. I got everything I need, I can tell you that. I live in such a world of, of peaceful contemplation most of the time. I know what my destiny must be. My destiny must be to stay sober, try to carry the message to the alcoholic. I know that I have to become self-supporting through my own contributions. That means I have to go to work. I went to a meeting when I got out of there and uh, my sponsor, Norm Alby, walked up to me and says, I'm going to be your sponsor. I, I didn't know what a sponsor was. I'm so indoctrinated in this book, I don't know that there's anything else. I don't know about a fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. And what I have to tell you here, if you knew that the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous is entirely different than the program of recovery that's in this book. And the reason that is that the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous is really bad because it's made up of alcoholics. <laughs> self-centered, self-seeking, egotistical driven people who have their own idea about how to do things around here. That's why they got the Alcoholics Anonymous. They had great ideas once upon a time. So I don't know what to do in a Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm self-centered to the core. So my sponsor says he's going to help me. I said, okay, what do you want me to do? He said, why do you ask me? I said, you just told me you were going to be my sponsor, Norm. He said, Johnny, if I can't run my life, what makes you think I can run yours? I said, then what am I supposed to do then? He said, why don't you just do what I do? Okay, Norm, what was it you do or is it you do? He gave me the great key to unlock the mystery of sponsorship. He said, well, if you do what I do, then you'll know what I do. I just broke it up for you. That's the great mystery. It's called monkey see, monkey do. <laughs> Be careful. A lot of people run around here wearing monkey suits ain't monkeys. They tell you, you don't have to drink. Don't drink no matter what. They tell you stuff like that. Just show up to meetings, don't drink, don't do nothing, you don't have to do nothing, just don't drink, don't drink no matter what. These people don't seem to understand that alcoholics drink no matter what. <laughs> they don't seem to understand that they'll drink before their butt ever gets sore, let alone fall off. We drink when nothing else seems to matter. We drink when we can't stand the life that we're living. We drink because we're guilty and we're lonely and we turn away from everything we know is decent in life, we drink with that because it's a guilt that permeates inside of our soul. And the program of Alcoholics Anonymous frees that soul to soar to heights that you never dream possible. What a wonderful thing this thing called Alcoholics Anonymous is. I look back on it with loving eyes and the longer I stay sober, the more I love this program of recovery the more I love its people, the more I see what a great thing has happened to got beat into an absolute state of nothingness when I got to you. When there was no other place for me to go but to climb up out of the gutter. It was the most amazing thing that I know of, a magic climbing. I can't stand here and tell you every meal I've eaten has been a banquet and every day I've lived on the sunny side of the street. I watched my mother drink herself to death here be powerless to do anything about it. My sponsor says the only thing I'm supposed to do is try to be her son. I don't know how to do that, but I was my mother's son for 30 years before she died. And I was the last thing that my mother ever saw when she passed. And she never forgave me for the death of my baby brother, but that's all right. God has, or I wouldn't be able to live with it very well. What I've learned here is my God, as I've come to understanding, is the great forgiver of all things. Makes it possible for me to live. All I've had is Alcoholics Anonymous instruction 
on how to be some type of a servant in Alcoholics Anonymous. I love the word servant. I love it more than anything. A servant serves. A servant doesn't dictate. A servant serves and does whatever they're asked to do, and they do it with some type of gentleness and kindness, and some type of acceptance. That's what a servant does. And so I have become a servant in Alcoholics Anonymous, not gladly all the time. You know, I, I, have, I have found it necessary for a guy like me to have a commitment or a fulfillment or a job in every meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous that I go to, no matter what it is. You know, making coffee or setting it up or tearing it down or sweeping the floors or shaking hands at the doorway or something. Whatever it is, I have to do something to justify my reality to sitting in a meeting. And I'm not just here sucking the life out of Alcoholics Anonymous, taking again, because I'm a taker. All takers are loser, you're looking one. And if I don't cross over that line from being a taker to being a giver, even on a part-time basis, I'm gonna die drunk. And if you're an alcoholic and you don't cross over it, you're gonna die drunk. I don't care what your sober living house has told you. I don't care what anybody's told you. If you're an alcoholic of my type and you continue to think that you're entitled to everything in life just because you don't drink anymore, there's a good chance you're gonna drink again. Because somewhere along this thing called life, what I have discovered in my many years in Alcoholics Anonymous, I have to contribute to life instead of taking from it. See, all I did was suck the life out of life before I came to Alcoholics Anonymous. And through the application of these principles and the guidance of a sponsor, I've been able to contribute something. I've been able to contribute into my home to my wife. I've been able to contribute to my children, to my grandchildren, to my great-grandchildren. I've been able to contribute to my home group, to my sponsor, to my Papa Chuck while he was alive. I have done all these kinds. I've been able to contribute to the greatest thing that's ever happened to me in my life since I've been sober is that I had to sit in my Papa Chuck's house for a year and tend to him while he died of emphysema. The only person that I remember up to that time that I ever loved unconditionally. The only man who was ever a father figure and treated me like a father treats a son. He went so far to tell people, I've just adjusted Johnny, he's mine. And I loved him beyond all things. And that's funny because I never uttered that word to another human being before coming to Alcoholics Anonymous. It was not in my vocabulary. Yet I can say it without a, without a choking thing in my throat anymore. I can tell you I love you and I mean it. I, mean, I want everybody in this room to do well. I don't want anybody to drink here. I hear things in Alcoholics Anonymous that just absolutely grind on me. I don't understand. I hear people come to Alcoholics Anonymous, get the podium flag and say, I come to you at great expense and great what I would, effort or something no effort for me to go to Alcoholics Anonymous and do what I've asked to do. You're the reason there's life breathing in me. You're the reason that my children are there. You're the reason my four grandsons are there. That my five great grandchildren are there. You're the reason, particularly Ohio and this area, you're the reason that I'm married to a woman that I love. Took her from you. I didn't even want to come here that weekend for Christ's sake. <laughs> Fifteen years we've been married, and I've got the scars to prove it. <laughs> but what a wonderful life. I, it, it, I know if you're new in Alcoholics Anonymous or you're having trouble, I know it's kind of hard for you to comprehend the idea that I can lay down at night and sleep. I think it's kind of hard for a newcomer or people who are having trouble in Alcoholics Anonymous to comprehend the idea that I live in a peaceful coexistence with the God I discovered here most of the time. I know it's kind of hard for people to believe and understand that the promises in the book Alcoholics Anonymous have manifested itself in my life practically every day. Sometimes just a quick flash through and sometimes not. 
it's hard for people to understand for me to see people that I genuinely love and want to be around. That I want to put my arms around them and thank them for allowing me the privilege of being coming into their presence. Well, that's, that's, a, big, that's a big jump from where I came from. They ain't getting no buses out there to get me from where I'm going to where I'm going. You know, they don't, they don't have it. A guy was reminding me of a little story. I want to tell you a little story. <clears throat> As most people know, uh, I love to play golf. I can't play baseball no more because my I've gotten old. I can't run and I can't throw, so I can go out there and monkey around with that golf ball. And a few years ago, a long time ago, a company I was working for bought me a membership in a country club. And I'm out there playing golf with a doctor on a Wednesday. Doctors play golf on a Wednesday. And I got things on my arms like daggers through skulls with blood dripping from them, <laughs> panthers with their whole side shot out, a monkey on my back in a convict suit smoking an opium pipe, just real, <laughs> real conversation pieces <laughs> at the pool. And we're talking, the doctor tell me about this reception of his that, that somehow or other got into shooting heroin and boy how doomed she was because nobody ever recovered from this heroin situation, shooting heroin. He went on and on and on about how he wasn't and I said to him, uh, I know somebody who did. He said, who? And I said, me. He looked at me, looked where we were, knew I was a member of this exclusive country club. He said, ho, 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 ho. you've never been in jail and done all those things. And I said, oh, yeah. See, it's kind of hard for people to explain or understand. This little man, a little Jewish orphan in New York, put himself through school. He went through college, high school, medical school, internship, and he became a doctor. He worked and he studied and he sacrificed and he became a doctor. And he ended up, as doctors do, playing golf on Wednesday. How in the world he's going to believe that I spent my entire lifetime running in and out of institutions, up and down streets, hurting, abusing, and tearing people, and I got sober and ended up in the same place he was in? <laughs> you know why? Because they say, they say, whoever they are, that you've got to work and you've got to study, and you've got to sacrifice, and you can't get out of this dilemma. But those people never seem to reckon with the will of God. You see, I also believe that everybody in this room has a job to do in Alcoholics Anonymous. I don't know what it is. I don't even know what my job is. I just do what I'm asked to do. But I do know that if you don't do that job, it ain't never gonna get done. If you don't do whatever job it is in Alcoholics Anonymous you're supposed to do, it ain't never gonna get done. So the way you find that out is you do a bunch of things to find out what people want you to do here. And I pray you find it. My prayers will be today, my prayers on the way home today will be for you new in Alcoholics Anonymous. I've had the extreme privilege of being able to sit with a man for two or three days this weekend, which is the highlight of my life, to watch, watch him come to life a little bit here in Alcoholics Anonymous, because he was exposed to Alcoholics Anonymous. Not just the fellowship, but Alcoholics Anonymous and the fellowship combined one thing. He's got a better chance than most of the people I know because of the exposure to you people and to Alcoholics Anonymous. Because that's all I've ever done. I've just come here and been exposed to you. And I'm telling you, my life is unfulfilled with joy and happiness to be here. I just, I think I'd rather be here this morning in this old room than I would anywhere else in the face of this earth. So until God holds us again in the palm of his hand, May we all meet in this happy road of destiny. Thank you very much.